Thank you all for having me. Uh, we're going to do twig pots tonight, which is a fun little project because you can use small scraps of wood. You don't have to have a big lathe. It's not necessarily a high skill project, but it's a fun project because in a very short time you can turn out some very nice little gifts for your uh, spouse or loved ones and nieces and nephews and grandkids and everything. So it, it is a lot of fun and it gives you a chance to be creative because you can go in so many different ways with it as you can see from these. Uh, the samples here. You can make them round, you can make them square, you can make them tall, short, you can make the stems long and skinny, you can make the uh, the tops flare out like a like a trumpet, uh, you can turn them in multi-axis and I plan on turning at least one multi-axis tonight. Uh, and you can burn them, scorch them, dye them, put beads on it, put Zentangle on them, you can put patinating wax on it, that's colored wax for those of y'all who don't <laughs> get, use a lot of, lot of wax. And you can put any kind of twigs. They show a lot better, and if you sell them, they sell a lot better if you put some twigs in it. So if you give them somebody, pick, go ahead and just pick up some twigs. Uh, twigs tend to work better than weeds, because sometimes the weeds, they, they're green, they might have some nice colored flowers, but then the next day they're gonna be all droopy and dried. So sometimes you're better off with something that won't dry out and get droopy on you and look, look ugly. But they display a lot better if you put something in them, if you're giving them to somebody or you're setting them up to uh, to, to sell. So let's go ahead and get started. If you have any questions at any time, don't hesitate to, to ask. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to start with a small block of wood. You know, the size is somewhat irrelevant. Uh, uh, this is about three by three. Generally, they're a little bit taller than they are fatter, but it doesn't make a lot of difference. You can mark the centers any number of different, different ways. Uh, I don't always have nice squared lumber, you know, so you can't always go from corner to corner like that, you have to use a little different technique. But this technique seems to work pretty well if you just brace your fingers and draw a, a smaller square, don't move the finger position. And then even when you get to, a, to an odd size a little bit, you can kind of uh, judge it a little bit. And what that winds up giving you, you, you don't have to color the thing all the, all the way if it drops off. It gives you a smaller target to shoot for to mark the center, and that's, that's all you're interested in doing. And when you finish, it's going to be round anyway, so if it's off a little bit, it just doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Unless it's expensive exotic wood that you don't want to waste a bit. Uh, I'm using a Steb Center. That's the one that's got a lot of little teeth in it. I think they sell these here. They're, they're, uh, they're nice in that they're, they act somewhat as a safety center. I've got a, I put a, a, a hole in here with a, uh, an awl. This thing is no longer spring-loaded because it, uh, it, the thing came loose. And that's the one thing about the cheaper ones. They've got the nice sorby ones here, too. Uh, and you do get what you pay for. If you ever look at those things and say, well, the sorby ones, you know, like $65 or $70, and these other ones are less than $20, they aren't the same. Uh, the, I haven't heard complaints from anybody with the sorby one with that point eventually coming loose. And it took about three years before that happened to me. but it eventually it will happen on the on the cheaper ones so first thing we're going to do put this thing between centers get a little bit of a little bit of tension on it make sure you turn the thing that it's not going to uh, knock and if somebody would remind remind me when I do the multi-axis put on a face shield but otherwise I'll just use the uh, uh, glasses until then so you put the uh, tool rest as close as possible maybe a quarter inch gap you're going to have it a little bit below center. The, the trick is not where the tool rest is as much as where the cutting ed edge is because you want the cutting edge to be at or slightly below center. And we can get the speed up a little bit here. And then what I tell, what I tell people, when you're roughing something, it's a little bit like cutting, cutting bananas for your cereal. You want to cut them, you don't want to cut your finger but on the other hand, you know, you're not getting points for style. And you want to get it done just as quickly as possible. Sometimes I shouldn't talk when I'm roughing or I wind up with a mouthful of this stuff. Now when you rough it, you always start 
a little bit away from the edge. You don't ever come into the edge when you're roughing, ever, because if you come in like this, you're liable to catch a, a, a corner of that thing, and there'll be a crack or something, and you wind up tearing a big splinter out, which is not a good thing. So you might be going this, uh, going this way, but once you get down to near this end, you're gonna change the directions for that last three quarters of the inch or so and go in the other direction. Always come off the end like that. And then catch it onto the wood. And you'll hear it change. All of a sudden it'll, it'll go from, you know, nicking a little bit to just going hiss when you're getting pretty close. Okay. Now we're going to move a little closer. One of the other things I didn't talk about uh, wood, you can use green wood or you can use dry wood. Uh, green wood is actually a little better, doesn't have to be perfectly dry, but if it's sopping wet green, there's a chance you'll get some cracks and then maybe that fits in your, with your design. Uh, it's like that, uh, I got a natural edge here I'm going to be doing later. But the natural edge, if it's got a few cracks in it, that look, tends to look a little more natural when you got bark on something. Uh, it looks like a design feature as opposed to a flaw. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, put a tenon on it to fit, uh, fit our chuck. I usually, I usually, for whatever reason, out of habit, I always put the tenon on the uh, tailstock end. You can do it on either end. But Using a pencil actually works a little better. If you take a pencil and put a little magnet on it, it makes it a lot easier to keep up with. But if you'll put that thing, lay it against your center, now you gotta check this out for your own particular center and lathe, but a lot of times this will come very close to matching your chuck. Unfortunately, I can't see it because I've got uh, anchor seal on this, so it's kind of absorbing it a little bit. And this is. This is a little bit big because it's sticking up a little bit, but we know we'll get a little smaller than that and we'll be all right. Now, one thing I learned in this classroom here from Jimmy Clues, when you're uh, doing a parting cut, you, go, you start off going straight in. Now, most people learn that you're supposed to scrape it like this. Well, that's true, but not when you start because for a lot of woods, this wood's not so bad, but for a lot of woods, if you go if you don't go straight in and you start scraping, you're going to wind up with a bunch of fraying here on the end. And you eliminate that fraying by going straight in until you slice those fibers and then you drop the handle to start getting that uh, peeling cut. Now, the key is you, you match your profile to your particular chuck jaws. And a lot of people don't understand that, but it's pretty basic. And you want to have a, uh, th this, this wall right here has got to be perpendicular to the lathe, no matter what the profile of the jaws, because that's giving you most of the support. Now, what varies a little bit is whether you have parallel jaws or whether you have a dovetail jaw. And what a lot of people don't understand, because they don't like to read the manufacturer, carefully read and understand the manufacturer's instructions, they'll take a Technotool Novachuk, for example, and somewhere along the line, they've read something that it's got a dovetail, and they'll start trying to put a dovetail on it, and they can't understand why they keep throwing bowls, and they think there's something wrong with their chuck. Well, the problem's not with a chuck, it's with a chuck operator. Because with the Nova uh, and the Patriot chuck out here, the Sorby, it uses the same style jaws uh, setup, and the jaws are interchangeable between the uh, Technotool and the Sorby, and also the Record Power. Uh, they'll all use the same. They have a, what, what uh, some folks call a hawk tooth, and it's, it's a tiny, tiny little dovetail that you don't cut. It bites into the wood by itself by using a parallel jaw. But if you try to make a dovetail, you're gonna have a problem holding the wood. Other chucks that have a dovetail, you'll have a problem if you don't make a dovetail. And I always turn around, tighten it up at least twice. Don't tighten it as hard as you can. One thing we know is wood can crush, and if you get it too hard, and I always like to uh, uh, bring up the tailstock support whenever possible, even when it may not appear to be necessary. Now, 
What I'm going to do when I eventually finish this and take it off, I'm going to wind up parting it off. So what I like to do as a start is go ahead and make a parting cut that becomes a visual sign for me for my design of where the bottom is actually going to be. It doesn't have to be very deep, but it doesn't go away like a pencil mark does. Now, visually, I've got something to kind of shoot for when I'm thinking about where I'm going to start or, or end this thing. Now, you can use any number of tools to, to do this. This is a spindle project, but, you know, a small, uh, a small bowl gouge, like a 3 8 inch bowl gouge, that works just fine. And you can get a little more aggressive with a bowl gouge, but actually a spindle gouge works just fine. This is a half inch, half inch sorby. I find the half inch a little big for most, most spindle projects. I tend to use a 3 8 inch most of the time for most things. But for this, you're hogging a lot of wood. And you're leaning off the tool rest a little ways. So maybe a half inch is a little better. Now before I get too crazy and eliminate my uh, opportunities for design, I'm going to look at this and think about a little bit about, well, do I want a flared uh, neck or do I want a narrow neck? But I've also got to drill a hole, so we're going to go ahead and do that. Uh, so you use a Jacob's chuck. Uh, I like one that doesn't have the... Uh, the wrench because I tend to lose the wrench and this, this is a pretty nice one, works out well. You can turn the, you can drill a hole with different sizes. Actually what I like best is 5 16 There's nothing magic about that. You know, if you like a quarter inch, try a quarter inch. But I think a three, uh, 5 16 gives you enough to put most any size little twig in it. You go up to 3 8 and maybe it's a little larger than you need and then it starts constraining your design. Now before I start drilling the hole, I tend to, uh, when I'm going to drill, I tend to get a skew or a can opener, whatever you want to call it. You come in like this and just go to the center a little bit to make you a little tiny little divot to find the exact center. So when you do hit that thing where you drill, you're more likely to, to not go off, off center. Now speed wise, uh, there's no reason to, to drill a hole pat faster than 700 and, and even slower than that if it's a bigger hole, but 5 16 you know, 758, that, that works fine. Lock this thing down. I always keep my left hand on the uh, Jacob's chuck. Not so important going in, but real important coming out. I like to go about 3 inches deep on this thing or 3 8 inch from the bottom, whichever comes first. Now this thing's only got about a four inch throw on it, so sometimes you gotta back up. If you got a mini lathe, they usually only have about a two and a half inch throw, so sometimes you gotta retract them and push the, push the tail stock back up. Now when it starts squealing like that, you need to be cautious. If it's green wood, you need to be especially cautious because once it gets hot, it's like popcorn. That, that water will get so hot, almost turn to steam, and it will lock that thing up, you know, quicker than that. It's not a bad idea to keep a little piece of paraffin sometimes. It won't s eliminate the problems, but sometimes it can help. And I just always keep paraffin handy. It's, it's handy to rub a little bit on your lathe bed. You can put a little bit against the uh, spindle face here and it'll, it'll prevent lockup with your, uh, your chuck. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I always like to chamfer the front of this into the hole a little bit. It just seems to add visually a little bit to it. So if you look at all of them over there, they're like that. And to do that, I, I like to use a detailed spindle gouge. People say, well, spindle gouge, what's the difference between one spindle gouge and another? And I'm fixing to show you. You can get a close-up of this. Three different, three different spindle gouges. Both these on the left are Doug Thompson gouges. This is a standard gouge right here, this one, 3 8 inch. 
This is a detail gouge. This has, I think, about 40% of the thickness milled. This one only has about 20%. So the bar is a lot thicker, even though the bar is, starts off 3 8 inch. There's a lot more steel underneath, underneath that flute. This is a Harbor Freight that I broke, and so it's a little shorter. I didn't wear it out. I broke the end of it off and reground it to, so I could still salvage it. This is a spindle gouge. Some people call them continental gouges, but they're a little harder to use for a lot of things. And it's pretty sorry, uh, pretty sorry steel, but they're all three spindle gouges. So this is my main, main go-to tool, but this one, because it's not milled as deep, it winds up having a shorter point. It has more steel, so if you have to ever lean over the tool rest, if you're doing some detailing around a bowl tenon, for example, it gives you a lot more strength and rigidity than you would with a normal one when, when you can't really cut it as clean and, uh, uh, with a bowl gouge because the wings get in the way on a big bowl gouge to get in there and clean up, the, uh, clean up that tenon. So this works real good for a lot of things. All right. This, this, this is not the only way to do it. It may not be the best way to do it. But it's my way of doing it after a lot of practice, reading, studying, thinking about it, watching videos. Um, if you ask, there's an old story, if you ask uh, 10 wood turners a question, you're going to get 11 different answers. And, and I think that's, that's probably, probably true. The one thing that they will all agree on is, number one, wood moves. If it's almost sharp, it'll almost cut. And you need to, you need to float the bevel and you need to cut a, with, with the grain being supported. Now this is a spindle, meaning the, the uh, grain in the wood is running parallel with the lathe. Uh, the trick is here is this is like a pencil. If you sharpen a pencil, and everybody in here has, you're going from here to here because the fibers are being supported. It would make no sense whatsoever to, to take, a, you know, take a pencil and try to sharpen it this way, would it? because you're going to be cutting into end grain and pulling up the fibers. And you'd be doing the same thing here if you went from small to large. If I go in here, I'm going right into end grain and pulling up fibers, and it's not going to work real well. Now with a bowl, with the grain going perpendicular, this guy, the point of this article, he was saying, the best, he thought about it a lot, he says, I think we ought to standardize on two terms, parallel grain and perpendicular grain. I thought, boy, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. This is parallel grain. It's parallel with a lathe. And this is perpendicular gr uh, lay, uh, grain. Typically how you do most bowls and, and platters. But that'd be like trying to get everybody standardized on terminology on a spindle roughing gouge. That for many, many years has always been called a roughing gouge. So I'm going downhill here, but now I want to come back in the other direction to the bottom of this cove for supported grain. And then it's, I'm just making a cove, so I'm going to come up when I get to the bottom, come up through the middle, and then change the direction. And here you can begin to see what I was talking about when I was talking about if you go to a bigger drill bit like a 3 8 inch, you know, it starts limiting how, how you can shape that throw to this thing. And the key on some of these things is, is continuous curves. Don't make anything straight. It, this curve always looks better, a continuous curve. Don't curve and, and then hit a flat, flat area. That doesn't work real well. Now here I got a design consideration. I can either leave this thing flat or I can round it over. I think I would prefer to probably just round it over a little bit. And then I don't like the sharp edge here, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna round it over. So I'm gonna look for the middle and basically I'm just turning a big bead where there's the there's the center of the bead. So here's where most of the wood's going to come off. So here's where I start cutting first. Now, it's not, uh, that seems pretty basic, but I've seen a lot of people that said, oh, I got to start cutting from here. And then they keep cutting from there. 
And every time they take this down some, they've taken the middle down some, and they wind up with just a much smaller, smaller turning. Uh, you eventually catch on to that when you've been turning a while, but sometimes it takes, takes a, a bit of experience and learning to, to get there. Okay, let's make it a little deeper. Deep, deep coves are more dramatic in appearance. Now, I'm no artist. Never claimed to be an artist. Never had any art classes until, you know, I got, didn't get exposed to art until I got into wood turning. But a lot of it is, is, is it can be learned. And some of us, you know, there's only so much we can learn, but... Uh, but I was talking about wood. One of the, the considerations of making these things is the form is, is, is important because the form will be there long after the wood turns into a brown lump because most wood is eventually going to oxidize and be brown. I'm going to use a thinner parting tool. This is one I made. Uh, this is 1 8 inch. And I bought this piece of uh, high speed steel off Amazon for less than five bucks put a handle on it, ground it, and I was off to the races. Now I can see where that form needs to go to tuck under. I could leave it like that, but then you stick it down and it's just like it sits on the table. The sides go boom into the, into the table or shelf. So you want to round it under so it'll look like it's floating off the table a little bit. Or at least that's the way I like them. Sometimes there's no accounting for taste, it's whatever you like. Now if I want to get back in there a little bit further, I could reach that with this detail gouge. The heels cut away a little bit just because it, it's just easier to get in a little bit deeper. And we'll get rid of a little of this excess wood that's getting in the way. Now at this point in time, I'd probably start uh, sanding this a little bit. We, not, we don't want to sand in here. I don't want to give you a lesson on sanding, but, but basically, you know, that's what the weed pot's going to look like. Now, I'm going to cut it off. I've got a pencil mark on there. That could be hand sanded off. So I'm going to use a thin parting tool now and to finish that part. When you part, you want to give yourself more than one width, width of the parting tool. So I, that's why I started with an eighth and I'm going down to a sixteenth of an inch. I've got a little bit of room. And you just kind of leapfrog on your cuts. Do a cut here, then do a cut next to it a little bit deeper. And I'm going to concave it in slightly so this will sit on the table. I don't like to part off at much below uh, or much faster than about uh, eleven or twelve hundred. Just because I learned from experience go faster than that, you're just generally asking for unnecessary trouble. It doesn't get, get you there any faster. I could part this all the way off, but there's a tendency to shred fibers at the very bottom on a, on a spindle when you do that. So I find it really, on some of these kinds of projects, it's safer and, and easier and you don't get any pulled fibers out of the very bottom. If you just take a, a small, you can use a hacksaw. This flush cut saw tends to work very well. These are not expensive, so it's a great wood turning accessory. So there we are. Now, the next one, we're going to do a multi-axis. 
All right, so I'm just going to eyeball what I think is the center on this thing. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line. And then I'm going to back off of this, this center where, that I punched by maybe, I'm going to say a half an inch, maybe closer to 3 eighths, somewhere right about there. Put this one here, and I'm gonna uh, a center. I, I like to use a spring punch. These these work real good for marking the center. If you don't have a center punch, it all works well. Also, now all I want to do, I, I'm not gonna mark the other end because it's hard to get that line drawn exactly parallel and all. But all I've really got to do is just bring this up and just get a feel for. Okay. Does it look parallel when I move it? Does it change axis too much in one direction? <coughs> I like this center better on some things where you've got this, this ring. The one on the Nova, the, the point sticks out a little too far, but this keeps it from splitting. Because it'll only go so far before it hits that ring. So I'm less likely to have a, a, an accidental blowout. And this is a very, very secure. Now it's going to vibrate, might vibrate a little bit. And you always make sure it's going to clear. Go to town, turn the speed back down. Slowly stand aside. Slowly speed it up a little bit. And I'll speed it up until it starts vibrating a little bit. And for this piece, you know, 1400 doesn't seem to be too bad. So I'm just going. Now I don't know if the overhead camera can pick is picking up that ghost image, but you can see where the solid wood is going to stay. Light cuts. This is green woods is very soft, almost like butter. Now before I get too carried away, the, the main thing I want to do first is I want to go ahead and put a uh, tenon on it. And I'm going to use a smaller chuck to hold on to this tenon. shape that down a little bit. Now we can probably speed up a little bit. Going faster uh, with multi-axis gives you a cleaner cut because it's got less, less time in the air, more time on the wood, but then there's a trade-off of, you know, how fast, how securely is it, is it mounted. And in this case, it's going like this, but it's, it's not off-center like this, where you have uneven pressure and it's, you, you more likely have a problem. This one, it's pretty secure, even though it might be wobbling a little bit. Does that make sense? Now it's kind of stopping. Get a lay of the land here. <coughs> so we got a ways to go. And just like before, I'm going to do a deep cove just because I like that style.
handouts are really for the guys that take notes. But it's whatever style you got. It's not what's right or wrong. It's whatever works for you. I'm just a note-taking kind of guy. So this is a 35 millimeter jaws, and this happens to be a Sorby set of jaws on a Technotool chuck. Like I say, they're in, they're inter, they've got interchangeable whole fixture uh, settings. Will all of the Sorby jaws fit on a Technotool? Yes. However, that said, if I was going to buy a set, of, this is before I knew the record power chuck, which has just come out, and uh, craft supply cells, it's got a 35 millimeter set that has the same style uh, hawk tooth as this one. So you use a parallel tenon and then this will bite in it. And I really like that design and I, I would much prefer that on this smaller, smaller chuck. What's the Sorby? Uh, uh, this, the, the Sorby's a dovetail. And generally, you can get away with small stuff not making the dovetail, so I didn't put a whole lot of, uh, you know, put any real attention into doing that. But yeah, if you're going to get a smaller chuck for a tech, uh, set of jaws for a Technotool, I'd sure look at that record power. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and flare this down a little bit instead of using the skew. See if I can't accomplish the same thing with this. Now, the fast way to drill these holes, if you were in doing production mode, is to get you some hand hand shaped drills like this just take a drill bit and a handle just brace yourself and and try to get it started in the center and start with a small one which is less likely i find i've had better luck of it not getting off center then you can come back with a with a 5 16 and it'll tend to follow that hole pretty well and it gets aggressive and jerking in until it gets to the bottom of that small hole Now the problem with this approach, it's fast, and if you're careful like this, it works pretty well. What, but you can see here from a close-up, you have a tendency not to always get it exactly centered. It'll become off-center, and the walls will be a little thinner on one side and fatter on the other. And, you know, if you're a perfectionist, that's kind of, it kind of de de detracts from it a little bit, depending on the size and shape. So if you want to do it right, it, it, I would say use a, uh, Jacob's Chuck. If you're doing a bunch of them, hey, experiment with your process until you can figure out how to get it, get it just right, and it'll save a lot, a lot of time if you use these hand drills. Even if it was turned off center, it's going to be off center anyway, isn't it? No, it's it's turned on a parallel on a, that off center was on a parallel axis from the center. It's just offset. In other words, he went right straight through parallel. He didn't offset. Multi-axis means there's two axes. There's a center axis, and then there's the secondary axis, but it's still there happen to be parallel. Now, some multi-axis, the things can be cocked. One is one direction, one's in, in the other direction, and you get different results. Sometimes you just got to turn some, uh, Hans, until you, you get, get your head wrapped around it. Something to put on your to-do list when you're not scroll sawing. And then I like to just, you know, kind of gently get it down in there. Now the other thing you got to remember with multi-axis it's important besides, uh, you know, vibration and having it centered. You got to sand it before you change the axes because you're not coming back. And if you don't sand it on the lathe, it's a real bear to sand it off the lathe. So this is where I would sand this part and we'll finish the base and, and, and sand, sand this part because we're never coming back to the center. We're gonna, we'd finish with it right here. Now, I did not put a part on this like I, like I should have to kind of see where I'm going. Now, use the, so I'm going to mark the bottom carefully because it's hitting air. And I'm going to come back and take another cut. So 
And now I can see where the bottom is. And now I've gotten away from the chuck a little bit, but I'm still going to have to be careful. But, but it also gives me a safety margin, because what I'm going to do, I've got to shape that bottom and I'm coming right into the chuck. Meanwhile, I got this thing coming around and hitting the air, uh, but I, I, I don't want th this thing to sit flat. So I'm carefully watching the ghost image. I think I'm going to switch to a bigger one, a little beefier. Again, riding the bevel, slowly. And if I slip, see, I would go into that crack and I'm less likely to hit the, the jaws. That's kind of a, a safety measure. <coughs> and that looks about right. Uh, I could be a little more aggressive. If I come up here a little further, I'm going to have less bark here. I'm going to opt for just having that part there and it being kind of flat here. So the next thing we do is go ahead and part it off. Now I've been told, uh, I had one guy that told me, you know, there's these rules, safety rules, uh, they're published in Craft Supply Magazine on lathe speed versus the, the size of your your piece and, and there's some basic validity to it as a rule of thumb. One guy commented uh, the video I had where I discussed that topic. He said, well, if, it's, if you go below a thousand and it, and it comes off the lathe, it'll just drop down. And I'm thinking, yeah, sure. if it's small. <laughs> this would probably pretty much drop down at a thousand. But if you got a platter, the speed is the same, but the miles per hour the further you out, out you get, it really starts going, and if you have a piece fly off, it ain't going straight down. It could go anywhere. So we're going to go ahead and take that flush cut saw again. Discretion is a better part of valor. And just saw that thing off. Okay, there's that one. Now a little trick I want to show you on sanding the bottom of these things. Is if 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 you go to your drill press, if you got a drill press, it works real well. You 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 take your little sanding mandrel and put it up in the drill press. And then you can come under here and you can get rid of this you know, little little cutoff damage area and make sure it's concave by hitting it on your drill press. But if you don't have a drill press or you're demonstrating, you know, you can do it on a lathe. Because this is just a horizontal boring machine, right? Now, you notice for this Jacob's chuck, it is not threaded for a draw bar. Generally, you would avoid using one in your headstock without a draw bar. But it's clean, there's no dings on it, it's got a nice fit, plus I'm going to be very careful to always have pressure going into the headstock and I'm not going to give it a whole lot of chance to come work its way loose and come flying off. Now, I've made these mandrels and I'm using a uh, quarter inch rod uh, coupler and that way it can go right in there. And it makes it real easy for quick changing these things because you just thread them in and out into that coupler. So we just take this right here, and so you can come along that edge like this, and just keep rotating it on the center, and you can make sure that you remove any damage you had, plus in addition, you make sure you get tend to have a concave bottom on the thing, so it will in fact sit, sit flat. We still got some time left, let's turn to another one. I said you can make different shapes, you can make them square. It's a little faster because you know you don't you don't cut the the flat sides. 
you just take that into consideration in your design. So in this case, I picked out a piece of wood that had some bark on the corner, and that gives it a, you know, an extra design feature. And then you put a little extra detail maybe, uh, like this case, a partial bead on the neck to give you, you know, your eye something else to, to look, look toward. Yes, this is a, I think they call it a three-eighths, but I'm not sure. It's probably closer to a half. Sometimes they measure, the, some, some places they measure where the teeth are. Others, they measure the outside. Most of them, I think, say where the teeth are, but it, they're actually larger where the, where the teeth are. So I think this may be three-eighths inch on the teeth and a half inch. This is made by Powermatic or, or Jet. They're, they're hard to find by them, but they were pretty reasonably priced when I got it but it was also a special, so I don't know whether they dropped that product or what. But there's other people who sell, sell small ones. I don't have it quite parallel, but probably ought to tweak that just a little bit. Well, I think I made it worse. We'll let it go. The other thing, you don't crank this thing down as tight as you can. It's just got to be snug. And, and if you've got a step center, what you've got to do is just, just hold it, twist it a little bit, and see is, is, it, is it holding. And it doesn't spin freely. If it spins freely, maybe you're not tightening it enough, and the spring on this thing is so tight it's pushing the wood away. So just tight enough to hold it. So in this case, we're going to put a, uh, we're gonna put a tenon on this end. So I'm going to start rounding this end off just a little bit because the base is going to come down. Again, I'm watching that ghost image. Depending on the size of the wood, sometimes you don't get it perfectly round because if you do, it might be too small to fit in your jaws. So you just get the edges knocked off on it before you start getting your parting tool to start putting that uh, tenon on it. In this case, this one will mark a little easier than, than that other one. You can see it a little bit better. And it's a real handy way to, to understand exactly how to size it. Again, the key thing is getting that shoulder clean and in this case, making sure that tenon is parallel. Mm -hmm. And Arthur and Arthur said he gets his to where the side is almost where the jaws are almost closed but not quite. Yeah. Because they have a tendency to be closer to centered and square. Yeah. When they're closed. Yeah. Okay. A lot of it's just reading the manufacturer's instructions, though. They'll all tell you don't let the wood bottom out in the bottom of your chuck, and a lot of people still do it because they don't know any better. And if they, you know, and like I say, it's got to match the profile. So you can see this one is, is pretty close just by marking it because I know what it'll give me by laying a pencil here. You gotta remember one thing, right? I'm sure you already all true men don't read instructions. Okay? All true men don't you know, other guys probably read them. And what's that other thing they say about experience is what you get five seconds after you needed it? Yeah. <laughs> For true men as well as uh, non true men. You know.
what this what this design looks like. Yeah, not too bad. I think I'll go with that. Since I've already got a starter hole, we're going to do the speed speed drilling. Now I didn't make these speed drills for uh, weed uh, twig pots. I made them for uh, lamp pulls, uh, light pulls, fan pulls. Uh, because it, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to, when you're in production mode, making those, those small things like that. Here we go. I'm going to slow this down. Because it's going to try to jerk it out of my hand. You watch. Let me get this back here. I'm going to brace myself. I'm going to kind of get ready to restrain it. Deep. Okay. In this case, I can, instead of measuring it, I know I can go almost to the end of the flutes. And if you get a visual indicator, it's better than measuring and you're less likely to make a mistake. I use antique oil for almost everything. Uh, I just, I just stumbled on that early. It's fast. It's e it's 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 easy. It's fast if you don't have to have it done tomorrow. It's fast that you slap oil on it. You wait 20. You know, I put it on the night before. Next morning, I put on a second coat, and after that, it's 24 hours between coats. If I don't want it too shiny, two coats is plenty. If I want it. Shiny, I can go up three, four, five, six till I get the gloss, and then I put it on the Beal Buff system. And it's just, it's just real. It's goof proof. It's you don't have to worry about uh, smelling up your shop with a with a spray. You can do it summer, winter, fall in your shop, and it doesn't smell too bad. It's just, it's just easy. And I like uh, Minwax. Uh, you can't get it at Home Depot. You can't get it at Lowe's. Can't get it at Walmart, but you can get it at the Ace Hardware store. And it's 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 a real good it's a good product. I mean, some people use Watco. Watco's getting harder to find, but uh, it's a good product. Uh, Minwax antique oil comes in red can, quart can. And if that particular Ace Hardware store is not carrying it, they'll order it for you. The other little trick I'll show you, sometimes drilling you wind up with these nibs, uh, nibs in the drill hole and there is a, an, an easy tool I found that helps out a lot of times for little holes like this is, is a plumber's reamer. And it, it's great for larging holes just a little bit where you're fitting two pieces together like a handle on a coffee scoop where you didn't get calipered exactly right, you just need to make the hole just a skosh bigger. But this will also work well for just cleaning it up, just very lightly, and it's real sharp. It's got about eight different cutters on it, and it's just a real handy uh, tool for things like that. Now they come in, most common sizes are half inch. I would, I would avoid a half inch when I would look around and try to get a five eighths inch, because that tends to be, I think, a more optimal size if you're fitting, fitting things together. It, it gives you a little, little more range to get up to 5 8 cents instead of stopping at a half.
We'll make this one a little bit different from the other two. I think I think I like the idea of putting a little uh, feature feature at the very bottom. I'm mark it so I can see it. That's where it, where I want it to go. And I'm just gonna take my cheapy homemade parting tool. Cut in, <coughs> cut in a little bit. Going real slow, get as smooth a cut as I can since I'm not sanding this. If you're in production mode on these things, be a good thing to practice to get it to the point where it's something like this, where it's kind of rough anyway. You know, just get as smooth a cut as you can and, and skip the sanding. Save a step and it may blend in just fine. But what I can see though, I've got some pretty rough edges right, right here. That's got to be trimmed up. Now here's the bevel. I'm going to enter it. If I just hit it any old way, if you're not careful, you're going to get a skate bag and do some damage. So since, since there's the bevel, that's got to be perpendicular to the wood to reduce the chances of kickback. And you still want to brace this thing in case you're still off a little bit. And I still got a little bit of damage here. I still got to clean this up. Okay, I got it cleaned up. And then we'll come over here. Have it perpendicular. And then just start cutting into the cove. Some people might want to put burn rings on it. Getting a little chatter, so I gotta slow down. Or turn the speed down. Or sharpen my tool. Or put some tailstock support on, on the on the piece. And I know if I see see a dark area, I've gone too deep. Okay. I kind of like that shape. All right, so again, just like last time, I didn't uh, I didn't put a parting cut on it, um, but because it's got damage on the on the bottom from, uh, or does it? Yeah, it's got a little little indentation. Uh, I could have probably eliminated that on the front end if I'd put a tenon on this end, turned it around, and concaved that end before I put the tenon on it and put it in here the bottom would have uh, been better and then if I had it sized right it wouldn't have left any damage on it and this could have actually been the foot so there's more than one way to do it uh, I think for the for this exercise I'm just gonna uh, leave it it's not worth the trouble of going through there and doing the parting I think you can see where take it off with the sander yeah yeah I mean it's just that little bitty hole there's a little bit of damage. That's what I was saying. I could have concaved this on the lathe when I, uh, when I had that end, but I could do the same thing with, uh, with, with an aggressive 80, 80 grit to get rid of that little mark. For some people, it wouldn't matter. All I got to do is get rid of the pencil marks, and they'd think it's fine. But, you know, so there we go. Oh, one little, uh, little trick my mother-in-law taught me. 
Uh, if you're going out and getting some dried flowers, that if you use hairspray, I don't know if they even use that stuff anymore, but if you use a aerosol hairspray, it almost acts as a uh, protective coat, uh, almost like putting a, putting a coat of shellac or lacquer on it. So that's an option. Uh, and I think that's about all the tricks I had. Thank you very much for having me.